today. Um, and thank you to my attendees for taking time out of your day. And Ted, you're on my screen first. So who are you? What do you do? Hi, everybody. My name is Ted Stachura. I'm the director of coffees for Equator Coffees, a roastery in San Rafael, California, San Francisco Bay Area. Happy to be here talking to you all today. Thank you, Ted. We're, re we're really stoked to have you here. Um, Mauricio, I know you've done this a few times now, but you still have to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ted, for joining us, for spending the time uh, with us today. Thank you, Jen, as always, for uh, introducing me. Uh, my name is Mauricio Jimenez. I am the general manager uh, at Bulk of Specialty at Genuine Origin as well. Uh, so on my day to day, I take care of the sourcing, I buy the coffees uh, with the input and help of Jen, Cindy, and Jay, and obviously Rob, uh, our marketing manager. Uh, and I've been with Bulk Cafe for 11 years. I am from Colombia. Uh, I work in origin for several years uh, out of Bogota, our operation in Colombia, our operation in Peru, and our operation in Honduras. Uh, after that, I moved to the US and I've been in charge of Bulk Cafe Specialty for three years and Genuine Origin uh, for the last two years. So very happy to be spending this time with all of you guys and also, thank you to our attendees for joining us. Yeah, so what that means is anytime one of you roasters says to me, why don't you have this coffee? That means I send Mauricio a text message and say, Mauricio, why don't we have this coffee? Um, and sometimes we buy those coffees and sometimes we don't. But do know that anytime you talk to us about those things, we pass it along to him. So um, a couple other little points of business. There's the Q&A function at the bottom. As always, feel free to throw your questions in there and I will work them in as we go. Um, sometimes we don't have time for everything, but you can always hit me up afterward and I will get you resources. Um, there will be a couple of polls as well. So, um, but with that being said, let's hop into it. Ted, let's, I wanna hear, like I know Equator, but I everybody maybe doesn't know Equator's history. So can you tell us a little bit about Equator and how how things operate? Sure. Yeah, you know, Equator uh, has been around for um, just about 25, 26 years now. Started in 1995. It was founded um, by two women, uh, Helen Russell and Brooke McDonald. Um, they had operated uh, coffee kind of kiosks previously, and they, you know, were trying to get information from their roasters that they were buying coffee from and felt like, you know, they were like, well, this coffee is from Guatemala. It's Guatemala coffee. What else do you need to know about it? And, um, you know, it was a little bit frustrating um, and they decided to kind of parlay their interests into a roasting operation where they could um, share more information about the coffees that they were sourcing and also, you know, use the knowledge that they had gained in cafe operations to help uh, cafes, restaurants, and so on kind of up their coffee game. So the the company uh, was founded on uh, a wholesale model. So supplying um, th those cafes and restaurants and bakeries and, you know, hotels, any place that you would drink coffee. Um, that's how Equator started out servicing uh, just that kind of uh, businesses. And then, um, you know, gradually, you know, through the, the dot-com era, they added online sales direct to con consumer and, you know, people were um, calling the roastery to order coffee over the telephone, um, that kind of mail order model. Uh, and then eventually, about eight years ago, um, Equator opened its first cafe. So the coffee landscape had changed quite dramatically from um, 1995 when the company was established to, um, you know, the, the mid 2000s uh, when the, or when the first cafe was opened. So, um, you know, the, the 
brand visibility was uh, opaque. You know, when you're just doing retail, you don't have a, when you're just doing wholesale, you don't have that retail presence. So the company was finding that many um, of these kind of a new restaurants that would open, they would be aware of other cafe, other roasteries that had a cafe presence, but not Equator because they didn't. So that's when uh, Equator kind of moved into um, to having cafe operations as well. Now we have um, seven cafe locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Oakland, San Francisco, and Marin County. And, um, you know, things are kind of going well through the, in the cafes through this kind of COVID period. So I guess we'll talk more about that later. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a background uh, on the company. Yeah. And um, also, I would love to hear a little bit about your coffee background as well. Sure. Yeah, I've been, you know, also in coffee uh, for 26 years um, and and kind of food service. And I kind of dabbled in in coffee uh, even before that. Um, you know, I was I was a barista before anyone ever referred to themselves as a barista. <laughs> That's how old I am. And uh, <laughs> pulling shots on a on a manual uh espresso machine yeah literally pulling the shots uh -huh. that's right back in uh, yeah very long time ago and um yeah i've you know full been working in coffee full time since 1995 i worked for many years at uh, pete's coffee uh, which is based in the san francisco bay area and uh it's um you know, it was at that time, you know, one of the better kind of coffee um, offerings out there. You know, there there weren't a lot of the coffee companies that we know today. You know, Equator was just starting up in that year. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, you know, Bay Area roasteries that you may know about now um, didn't exist at all. So, um I, I worked there for many years. I did retail operations, uh, managed cafes, and then kind of transitioned to uh, coffee and tea training, uh, education, you know, training uh, frontline staff, retail, um, the, the wholesale uh, distribution teams and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then eventually moving more to the content development side of the business and uh, focused on developing training materials, you know, ma manuals, lesson plans, uh, job aids, videos, all those sorts of things. So uh, it was a nice little career stint there. Eventually I um, left Pete's and started working with Kenneth Davids. Um, Many of you may know him as a, an author. He's written you know, four books on coffee. He uh, is also is co-owner and founder of the website coffeereview.com, which is, you know, you probably know that website as well. It's kind of like the wine spectator of, of, of the coffee world uh, and operates his own consulting business. So I, uh, it was a great kind of uh, graduate school for me um, as, you know, I thought I knew a lot about coffee after being in the business for many years. And then I had my, you know, my first week working with Ken Davids and I was like, oh my God, there's so much more to know. <laughs> so uh, it was, it was a really um, great few years I spent there working with him, uh, splitting the time between uh Tasting Coffees for Coffee Review, which is, you know, tasting coffees from all over the, the United States and internationally, evaluating them blind. Uh, it gave me a really good sense of what was going on during that transition period where like many new roasteries were opening up and, uh, you know, there were, there were different roast degrees that were uh, being introduced at that time. Um, you know, coming from the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, that's like the arguably the birth, birthplace of, you know, dark roast coffee. Um, there was, you know, a big transition that was happening. And um, 
so it was, it was good to be working with Ken at that time. And then on the consulting side of the business, you know, we had many different clients um, and we were, you know, able to run quality assurance programs and, um, and, and source coffee and um, had all kinds of uh, fun projects, some at, at Origin and, you know, some, some trainings uh, at the lab. So I, I learned how to roast there, I, you know, managed the cupping lab and it was uh, a good period. Uh, so before, it, I also helped um, found a company called, uh, well, Coffee Informatics, uh, you, better known as Roast Log. Uh, it's a data logging system designed for coffee roasters, helped you know, get that system off the ground. Um, and eventually uh, that led me to Equator Coffees. They were demoing the, uh, the hardware and software package as we were launching. And um, that's when I met Helen Russell uh, and we started talking about uh, the needs of Equator. And, um, and they were looking for someone to uh, step into the role to, to source coffee, to manage quality assurance programs, to kind of work with the roasting teams to you know, make sure that we kind of keep the coffee uh, at tasting great and consistent. And, you know, I thought it was a great opportunity. So I signed on with them and I blinked and 10 years have gone by. So, uh, so time flies and, you know, I've, I've, you know, felt like I've in the in that time I've kind of made my mark on the company. We've uh, streamlined some of the offerings that uh, we offer, um, and you know, as the company transitioned from a wholesale only business to a mix of both wholesale and retail. So we have a very dynamic single origin coffee program um, that we feel helps keep. Uh, consumers engaged uh, and, you know, because we'll always have something to talk about that is is new. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a, you know, fun way to see the company progress over many years and kind of my, my career path along with it. Yeah, you gave me, you gave me flashbacks to when I started in coffee as a barista in the late 90s. And my elbows have never been the same. <laughs> and also, yeah, you'd feel like it. what training? <laughs> yeah, you'd feel it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny when you mentioned that when I started at uh, Pete's Coffee, you know, I knew how to make espresso already, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, uh, when they trained me on the bar, they said, yeah, and you'll, you know, you're required to wipe the steam wand after every use. I was like, what? I mean, we'd yeah. maybe do it a couple times per day. <laughs> yeah, that's why you soak it at the end of the night. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just, no, you just click, click, and there's a tamper on the espresso machine. That's all you do. Oh, wow. How far we've come. Um, well, I think this is where, where Mauricio is going to be able to jump in a little bit more, too, but... Um, you know, if, if people have spent any time looking into how Equator or just looking at Equator's website or kind of following along on social media, I feel like there's some things you would start to pick up. So I want to get into your sourcing approach. Um, and I want to start with the chain of well-being. So can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, the you know, you could go to Equator's website to read in more detail about mm -hmm. the the chain of well-being. It's something that you know we kind of mention even even in our coffee bags, and it's a way of kind of thinking differently about the the supply chain. You know what we think about normally, which is you know very cold and <laughs> and um, and and calculated and instead we're looking you know kind of taking that vision that Helen and Brooke had when they founded the company and kind of being transparent and offering information and education and um, and building in sustainability into your supply chain so making it um, you know th that chain of well-being is that you know everyone along that, supply chain is 
going to be respected, treated fairly. And, you know, as far as that relates to sourcing is, um, you know, building kind of long-term sustainable relationships between the roaster, uh, um, the, the roaster's relationship with the producer and the roaster's relationship with the consumer and kind of all the players in between. And so we want to make sure that, you know, everyone is being treated fairly uh, through this chain of well-being so that we can uh, build like long-term uh, sustainable relationships based on quality. So we find that identifying um, a producer that could supply us with good quality coffee or has the potential to working with them year over year that's that kind of sustainability that they could depend on that they know that you know equator will be able to continue to buy coffee from them year over year and they could rely on that um that relationship so it's yeah just but you know it, it, the the chain of well being being kind of transcends just green coffee sourcing i mean we basically look at all of the vendors you know whether it's uh, you know paper cups for the cafes you know lids and straws you know we're looking literally at every item that we purchase and say like you know what kind of you know what kind of business what kind of businesses are we partnering with and kind of learning about them and making sure that they're um, their views align with ours and, um, you know, the company is a B uh, certified corporation. And, um, you know, so that's kind of built into our ethos is that, 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 uh, and, and uh, expressed through that, the chain of well being. So it's a little. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I was thinking too, with you were mentioning the shift from wholesale to re adding in retail and having a pretty broad menu. So how, and just thinking about overall wholesale and grocery and all of that stuff, how does that influence your sourcing? Um, well, yeah, I, I, I really kind of think of our um, coffee menu in, in two different parts. So there are the the blends that we offer year round, those are, um, mostly kind of fixed flavor profiles. So, you know, we have like our house blend, which is, we call equator blend. It's should more or less taste like equator blend from month to month, year to year. And um, so we're, we're buying coffee in order to, um, to maintain those flavor characteristics over time, whether that's for, you know, Equator blend or, you know, a mocha java French roast, uh, all, all of our espresso blends and everything. Again, if you look at our website, you'll see we have a, a huge range of, of um, blends. So there's, there's that part of the business. And because, um, you know, although a big chunk of that goes direct to consumer as well, a lot of it goes to our wholesale accounts, you know, businesses that you know, they might like single origin coffees, but they don't want to be serving it in their cafes just because, you know, they're only available seasonally or, you know, they just want like a good tasting crowd pleasing uh, roast, maybe at a darker roast degree than we do our single origin coffees. So, you know, what coffees that go good with milk, all that sort of thing. So, um, so we tend to buy a lot more volume of the Kind of blend component coffees, and then the other part of the business is the is the single origin side, which you know I alluded to. We work kind of seasonally, so this time of year we're releasing coffees from uh, Peru and Ecuador and Rwanda and Burundi, and um, and then as we roll into the summer months, we bring out coffees from Central America from. Ethiopia, Kenya, and we offer these coffees for a limited time. Um, and that time period ranges uh, depending on the coffee from, you know, I'd say, you know, two months on the short side up to maybe five or six months on the long side. And then we sell out of them for the season. Yeah. And 
um, with those coffees because we are offering them for a limited time and we are regularly introducing new coffees, um, which, you know, again, tying them back to our cafes with the same kind of dynamism that we have on our, on our retail website, we also want to have in the cafes. So every month we offer two different coffees on pour over. We uh, change up the single origin espresso in our cafes every couple of months. And um, there was a time we kind of stopped doing it um, during COVID because of the slowdown in business, but we used to offer a choice on batch brew where we would have a, a blend our equator blend, as well as the single origin coffee that we would change monthly. So kind of having those, uh, those coffees rotate through our cafes means that you're sourcing a lot of single origin coffees over the course yeah. of the year. I mean, you can do the math and that means, um, you know, in some cases kind of buying less volume. So, you know, the more expensive the coffee is, the less uh, interest you'll have from consumers. You know, there's only you know, some people are real kind of value shoppers and will never buy a very expensive coffee. So, uh, but we do like offering those really special, you know, geishas and that kind of thing. So, you know, we'll buy small volumes of some coffees, medium volumes of others, and then kind of larger volumes of the coffees that we know are going into blends. Ed, yeah. would, you, would you mind chatting a little bit with the German origin customers? How do you measure and how do you select one of your suppliers? And, and basically, how do you score them versus, you know, they comply with my idea of sourcing uh, and they are part of what I will call, you know, the welding chain? Like, you know, what are the criteria sure. that you look into? Because just Jessica Jen sent me a couple of emails and she was asking me about you know, what, what was the FOB pricing that we pay for this coffee one year ago or maybe nine months ago? And as much as I am always willing to share that information with a customer who bought the coffee and wants to know how much we're paying for the coffee, you know, the FOB price is not the best indicator to actually know if you're being sustainable because you have so many players in the supply chain. It's not only the importer, the exporter, the you know, the wet mills, the cooperatives. So, you know, how do you go beyond that and how do you incorporate your sourcing philosophy and this whole B Corp idea into your, into your sourcing on a, on a day to day? Right. Yeah, that's a lot of question. <laughs> it's a big question, I know. But if, if you can just give some ideas yeah. for people to, to you know, of just... Of course. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think back to my... Uh, experience at Equator, you know, when I started, and I'm, I'm guessing that many of the people on the call today are kind of newer into the coffee industry, um, you know, still kind of establishing their uh, buying practices and, you know, sell, you know, just kind of figuring out how that works. So, so when I started at Equator, although I did inherit some um, long-term kind of purchasing relationships, much of what I was kind of learning over time was, uh, or, you know, just kind of reestablishing uh, the, the kind of sourcing practices as I went along. So, you know, I was taking, you know, I was trying to formalize relationships. So as if I was noticing we were buying from a particular cooperative through an importer, I would work toward um, kind of formalizing a relationship with the cooperative in collaboration with the importer in order to secure that uh, supply of coffee on an ongoing basis. And, and that often includes travel to, to origin where you're able to kind of meet with the, you know, the, the heads of the cooperative or the, or the owners of the coffee farm and they could learn a little bit about your business. You could learn about their business. You know, you're kind of feeling each other out and, and vetting the, the um, you know, the operations and deciding it's like, yeah, is this something we, we want to move forward with? 
And once you have had that opportunity to meet face to face, then that's kind of the beginning of a relationship. So even if you've purchased coffee from that same cooperative for several years, but you've never actually met the people, then you know it just doesn't really feel like a, like a relationship on, until you you have had that opportunity and like ha are able to have those discussions about coffee and quality and the the you know the expectations of quality can be very different uh, for for the, you know when you have roasters often from different parts of the world and they're just like looking for different flavor profiles and the producers aren't going to know that unless you have that conversation with them so we might go into you know say in sumatra we might say hey you know we are looking for coffee from this origin country you know huge coffee producing island uh and you know they have many different flavor profiles so we're saying well let's define those flavor profiles so that when you send us a sample we're not rejecting them but we're saying yes this is this is exactly what we're looking for and having um, an import partner like you know vol cafe genuine origin uh, on your side to be able to facilitate that conversation is really valuable especially um, you know, a, a company that has operations uh, in the producing country, you know, that really helps kind of facilitate communications. You know, we're, of course, buying coffee from many different parts of the world. So there's challenges with, um, you know, not being able to speak the language necessarily where the where the coffee is grown. So having that um, having that avenue to be able to uh, to have like translation and and conversation that way but we you know we do all of our you know although we do taste coffee when we're traveling we do the the vast majority of our evaluation at our roastery so we want to be able we want to have the same environment the same water the same cupping protocols in place when we're making purchasing decisions and that's where we're tr truly able to um, be able to evaluate the coffee in a uniform way. We're the small team that we have that sources coffee at Equator is very well calibrated um, with one another. So, you know, I have confidence that- That is, know, that is I'm, rule number one. Don't buy yeah. coffee when traveling. <laughs> you are overexcited and you are, over thankful for being there, for spending time with the producer, and it's better to just breathe a little bit and, and make a decision once you are back in your office with your water, with your equipment, and you can make a proper decision and a, and a proper evaluation. Yeah. That's, it's that's totally a thing we, we chat about on our trips is like, you cannot buy coffee while we're in the cupping lab in Guatemala. We can't do it. It's um, always a temptation, but it, but it shouldn't happen. I do, I do want to jump in because um, there, there have been a couple of really great questions that I think tie into this really nicely, which is you build these long-term relationships and you usually buy from certain producers, but what happens with those long-term relationships when the coffee isn't to your standards? Right. Um, well, you know, it various things. I mean, you know, we have worked with co-ops that we feel have the potential to improve quality. So, you know, we feel, cause we kind of have kind of certain thresholds of, you know, flavor profile expectations for particular types. So if there's a coffee that goes into a particular blend, say a fair trade and organic certified uh, washed mild Latin American coffee that, you know, has to have a certain flavor profile. You know, we might work with a co-op that is um, is kind of on the lower end of that expectation, with the hope that over time they can kind of elevate that score. So that that takes some some vetting uh, in order to determine that. But uh, we do have a little bit of flexibility in that you know we we've been in situations where we've rejected coffee from 
you know, partners that we've worked with. Um, they're able to regrade the coffee in some cases to meet the flavor profile expectations that we need. But these are really kind of rare situations. Um, I mean, I should say it's it's not it's not uncommon to have fluctuations from crop year to crop year. You're like, man, like last year was so good and this year like isn't quite as good, but still within that window of ex acceptability. Um, but when you kind of drop below that window of, ex of, of what's acceptable, then you have to have like the hard conversation. And that that's what's not really that common because the producers that we choose to work with are doing generally a really good job at what they do and and because we are calibrated you know i'm going back to calibration we're not just like calibrated with our team members within equator but we're also you know calibrated with you know mauricio and with uh and if the the cooperative has coppers you know we're we're all trying to like calibrate with each other so that when we say because you'll you'll hear you know, people within the industry throwing out cupping scores and they'll say oh, it has to be an 86. It's like, well, what's an 86? What's an 86? You? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the industry has come a long way in kind of standardizing that that process. But, you know, and, and the same is true for tasting terms. Um, but there's still, you know, a little bit of uh, variances that will only come uh, will only uh, kind of resolve themselves as you continue to cup the same samples, you know, maybe thousands of miles apart from each other, um, but you're tasting those coffees and we're offering feedback back with back to the producer saying like, these are what we're picking up. These are our flavor notes that we're picking up in the coffee. This is, this is the score we would give to this kind of coffee and they need to kind of understand that. And you know, even if your scores aren't the same, that I think it's as long as you're kind of calibrated to that understanding. So, you know, there's some sometimes where, you know, someone who's selling coffee will say, "Oh, this coffee scores an 86," and I'm like, "Okay, so like I'll, in my mind, I'm saying that should be about an 85, or whatever." <laughs> and on so, my you know, end, it's it's always. This roaster hates Kenya's. This roaster cups naturals right. two points higher. It's so yeah. It's right. it's it's uh it's an imperfect system, but I think we you're it's all just calibration and getting to know everybody in the chain. Yeah, I think the the key is also having realistic expectations. Yeah, you know, you're buying a Colombia, and a Colombia should taste like Colombia, and you shouldn't expect that if you're buying a full container of coffee every single year is going to be an 88 or an 87, but every single year is going to have the characteristics of that coffee that you like from Colombia, maybe a little bit more acidity, a little bit more body, but you know, you have to buy it for what it is. And a relationship is a, is a relationship. You are not always winning. Sometimes you are just part of that relationship because you want to have an stable supply chain, which is important for you. Some years the coffee is going to be better. Some years the coffee is going to be, you know, not as great. But it's, it's understanding that and having the, the clear expectation. It's completely different when you are receiving coffee that is maybe defective or, or it has a problem. And then you need to have the, the difficult conversations and you have to reevaluate if it's worth continuing with, with the partnership. Yeah, exactly. And that and and our job as roasters is, you know, as we, you know, we talking about valuing this kind of long-term sustainable relationships with the coffee producers is is buying those coffees when they're, you know, that lot that's not as good as last year. Uh, you know, we could turn around and say, sorry, doesn't match. I'm gonna source from someone else, and you might be able to find a coffee that's one or two points higher but you're just dashing that um, that long-term partnership away in that case. So our job as roasters is, you know, when we, we it, you know, for Equator, it's to like nurture these long-term relationships. And as, as a roaster is to make sure like our blends taste the same, 
even if that coffee is cupping a point lower than it did last season. And that might mean um, adjusting the roast profile. That might mean adjusting the recipe components in order to, to tweak that blend into a position that it, that it should be so that our customers are not, are not noticing the things that we notice on the cupping table. I mean, a point, you know, point score difference, even two, um, will be difficult, especially in a blend uh, for any, you know, your average consumer to be able to discern. I mean, even, even an expert uh, cupper, I think it would be hard for them in a blend format, uh, just tasting a cup of coffee on its own. Um, but at the same, but because we're cupping these coffees, you know, every day um, as part of our uh QC process, you know, we're tasting our production roast. So we're like we're so in tune with each blend as they're supposed to taste. And as you're moving through, you know, a container of coffee or, you know, whatever volume you're doing, you know, keeping coffee over the course of several months in some cases, um, you know, coffee changes in flavor over time. And, you know, we, by evaluating your coffee on a, a regular basis, you're able to notice those changes as they're happening in real time or, or an, even anticipate them and make adjustments in advance of any significant impact to your, to your blends. It's, that's kind of the, the, the magic of, <laughs> of coffee roasting. Um, and it's, and it's a, but there's a feed, really critical feedback loop between the roasters and the, the people who are sourcing the coffee. In your case, it might be the same person, but you know, it's so critically important to taste the, co the roaster taste the coffee um, because they are making uh, you know, critical decisions on the roaster as they're roasting and they need to know what impact that has on the cupping table. So that's, that's, that's a really key part to this equation. Yeah. So we're getting to our last like 10, 15 minutes ish. Um, right. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask the big question that I told you I was going to ask COVID. Uh -huh. um, what, how has COVID impacted Equator? What's, what are some of, have you made big changes? Like what's working? What wasn't working? What have y'all learned through the last year? Yeah, I mean, it's been a really challenging uh, almost 12 months now. Um, I'm like looking at the date here. This uh -huh. time last year, I was in uh, kind of my, my last hurrah. I was in Colombia and Panama and I returned from. So I was I was judging in a competition in uh, Cauca uh, this time last year. And then on Friday, the 13th of March, I returned uh, to the to the Bay Area, and we all went on lockdown that following Monday. I was supposed to travel uh, to the Bay Area that Monday, so that got <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. So I haven't been I haven't been you know anywhere um, you know coffee related since then, uh, and yeah, it's been a really challenging time for Equator. Um, you know, because so much of our business is still wholesale, um, you know, restaurants closed down, hotels, um, you know, they decreased the amount of business they were doing profoundly. You know, we, we sell, uh, a, you know, some of our big, biggest accounts are tech companies. Everyone started working from home. Um, airports, people stopped traveling so much. And yeah, so the volume of coffee we roasted, we, you know, we roasted in March and April of last year just plummeted. Um, and, you know, very gradually over the course of the summer months, it, you know, we regained some of that business and then it kind of stabilized and we were kind of flat through late summer and into the fall. And then during the holiday season, we picked up uh, a little bit. And then we kind of went down in January and now we're starting to pick up again, you know, as people are being vaccinated, there's a little bit of hope for the future this year. Um, we're seeing some of our wholesale business start to come back and we're hoping for more of that 
uh, in the coming weeks and, and months. Uh, but yeah, we had no idea that this COVID crisis was going to be as uh, protracted as it is. Um, you know, on the on the plus side, we saw a massive growth in direct to consumer sales. You know, through our website and our partner websites. You know that that there's been huge growth there. We've never focused too intently on grocery, but that blew up in the little bit of uh, grocery business that we did have. We work with, with one distributor, and they were, you know, suddenly ordering, you know, three, four times what they had previously. Um, you know, that's where people are getting coffee. You know, they're staying at home, ordering it online, or getting it from grocery stores. So, so that part of the business has been great, but it doesn't make up for the volume lost in wholesale. And it's also much more kind of labor intensive to pack, you know, all of those 12 ounce bags and mm -hmm. mailers on a daily basis compared to, you know, a busy cafe ordering 80 pounds of coffee per week in five pound bags, you know, having, uh, you know, you could kind of <laughs> figure that out. You know, you need a lot, a huge amount yeah. of, uh, new retail business to make up for even kind of one busy uh, wholesale account. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's been challenging, you know, thinking back, we had to deal with uh, some, some furloughs initially, everyone was offered job back eventually. That was mostly in our, in our retail um, division. Uh, unfortunately, we, there were some layoffs because, you know, the, you know, trainers weren't able to go out into the field and work with wholesale customers, especially ones that were, you know, not operating or operating at a much scaled back level, you know, was not uh, safe to be kind of working in close quarters. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, com the equator kind of reacted quickly to the, the new reality on that side. And I think that helped stabilize, um, the company at that time. And then as time progresses, we're able to kind of hire people back uh, in a way that makes sense for the way that the new, um, the new business levels dictate. Dang. Yeah, it's been, so. it's been interesting to just talk to roasters around the country and just hear how it's been, how the impact, how different the impact is. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so we've been purchased, you know, and we, we, the, the hardest part, you know, as a, someone who buys coffee is that I was suddenly not buying mm -hmm. as much coffee. Uh, I mean, I just put a complete halt to coffee purchases altogether as I kind of was taking in um, what was happening over the course of weeks and, and then months so, uh, you know, it became really difficult, you know, as having to have conversations with longtime suppliers saying like, hey, I'm still going through the coffee that I have on hand now. You know, normally we would be booking coffee to land in, you know, three, four months from now. Uh, but I'm not going to have the need for that same volume by that point. So, you know, I would either purchase less coffee or um, or in some cases we would have to say, yeah. I'm, I just need to wait and, and decide how much coffee I need to purchase at a later date uh, in order to kind of get through that volume. But, you know, we've been trying to, you know, like share the love <laughs> amongst all of the different um, coffee producers that we work with. So, um, and that includes now this new crop year cycle, which, you know, I'm going back to some of the producers that we said no to last year as we said, hey, you know, I, you know, I can't buy new coffee right now. So I'm coming, coming back to them this year and saying, okay, like, let's, let's kind of reestablish business. So, um, you know, I could. That's kind of the, it. that's kind of the other side of the relationship. No, you build a partnership yeah. and they expect you to buy same quantity or in most cases, producers, they expect you to grow and buy more. Yes, and it's not definitely. Possible. And, and it's a really hard conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've had and and mostly it's been you know we we have a conversation with them before making a decision, and you know oftentimes like you know I think in in Peru I was working with a couple of different cooperatives 
And one of the cooperatives said, you know, because of the because of COVID, we're not going to be able to supply the the quality of coffee that we normally do for you. And we were like, oh, whew, what a relief <laughs> because we can't, you know, we can't um, buy, you know, we can't buy very, very much coffee this year. So the fact that they were saying like, hey, you know, we're going to, we're just going to process the coffee we can. They, it's an organic uh, uh, and fair trade certified cooperative. They have many customers who don't have as high quality expectations as we do. And they were able to, to just process the coffee for those types of customers and keep business going through the past year. And then the hope is for this next cycle, you know, they'll be able to have all of that, you know, infrastructure worked out where they'll be able to, um, to produce those higher quality lots again, and we'll be able to purchase again. But so in that situation, you know, again, through conversation, I was able to say, well, that's good. We're instead of working with two cooperatives, we're going to not work with one this year, uh, um, as mutually agreed upon and focus our purchases from Peru from the other cooperative, which was able to maintain that same um, quality expectation. So it's, you know, it's, it's a dialogue and it's not easy, um, but, you know, we're, we're fortunate that, um, you know, the, it's important for producers not to have all their eggs in one basket, you know, not to sell their entire volume, their entire production to one roaster. Uh, but they are often selling, you know, they're selling to the U.S., they're selling to Europe, they're selling to Asia, they're selling to Australia and other markets, maybe within Latin America. And um, by having that diversity, that geographic diversity, that quality diversity, you know, they're able to make things work when there is a change in business. And from the standpoint of the roaster, it's like we typically don't, see radical changes in business. COVID was the, the exception. You know, what in the 10 years I've been with Equator, it's been business as usual with a little bit of growth. You know, and that cycle just continued year after year. And then COVID hit and ended that. And, you know, when I was talking to producers, they're like, yeah, now you know what we feel like when like the rains don't show up or, you know, a hurricane passes through or Roya or, you know, civil conflict, you know, there's, there's so many things that coffee producers have to go through. Like one year they'll have massive amount of coffee. The next year, a very small amount. One year, the quality may be very high. The next year it's average. And that's normal for coffee producers, but not for, not for most roasters. So uh, it was a, a interest, a lot of interesting conversations this past year. And um, you know, I didn't purchase uh, as much coffee as I used to, but, you know, we're, we feel like we're kind of digging out of the hole and we'll get back there and kind of maintain um, all of the kind of relationships that we have established over, over many years now with the, the producers that we know and, you know, consider friends in many cases. All right. So I, I think in the, two... I think in, again, in the in the same way that you have to diversify and you have to plan your menu, you kind of have to do the same with your sourcing. So building a relationship shouldn't be the final objective; is a consequence of finding, as Ted was saying, finding the right quality, finding somebody that can produce the same quality of coffee that you need year over year, and incorporating that into your menu. I know a lot of people. They feel like I need to establish a relationship just because that is what a true roaster is supposed to do. But I think you have to basically first evaluate your suppliers from a quality point of view, from a price. And then you decide, okay, yes, I want to start exploring this and I want to develop it and grow it into something that I can do every year. And don't buy 100% of your coffee in this way because you are going to put yourself in a difficult situation that if anything happens you need to have very tough conversations so i'm i'm interrupting because we only have about five minutes left and i have two more questions i want to get to so you've both been warned um first being um a really interesting question came up in the chat 
which is about a time frame for sampling old coffee and and trying to get an understanding of what consumers might be tasting. So like I know in my kitchen, I have bags of coffee that are like three months old that I'm still drinking. Um, I buy a lot of coffee for my house. So Ted, I'm interested in, in from a QC perspective, what, what Equator does or what you would recommend. For roasted coffee or green coffee? Ro roasted coffee. Uh, well, I mean, we don't, fortunately, we don't have that problem. We have a, a roast to order model. So, you know, we, you know, orders that are placed on Monday morning or, or during the day on Monday are put into our system on Tuesday, are roasted and fulfilled um, that day, and either kind of sent out via UPS, USPS that same day, or delivered the following mor morning. So within uh, 24 hours of roasting, the coffee is in transit to the customer. And you know, for our wholesale customers, we work with our uh, our account managers to um, find pars that work for that customer and their delivery schedule and everything so that they're not stuck in that situation where they have like one month old coffee okay. when they're able to get coffee delivered. You know, we deliver coffee in our own truck and we do uh, a, the, a lot of UPS delivery to wholesale customers. So, um, so, you know, we say, you know, if you're, if you're finding you have too much coffee, you know, at the end of the week and that coffee, you're still going through that coffee a week after that. And even, you know, into the third week and they need to like adjust their pars to something that uh, is smaller because we do have this advantage of being able to deliver on a weekly basis. So, you know, we say order, you know, you, you want, you don't want to be short coffee either. So, you know, just order coffee, um, a, you know, a week and a half's worth supply. And so you have, you know, so you could also have it in-house. Um, you know, we mark the roast date on the bag so they can age the coffee out for, you know, if they're pulling it for espresso and they know that coffee really doesn't start singing until like seven or eight days after roast. And, you know, they're receiving the coffee three days out of the roaster, you know, so they could kind of like work that timing uh, into place. So we have the, we have account managers who can help, uh, you know, our, our wholesale accounts kind of figure that out. Gotcha. And then for the final question, I want you to think about baby Ted getting into coffee or maybe yeah. a new roaster getting into coffee now. Um, do you have like some key feedback or pointers that you would offer at this point in your career? <laughs> Um, you know, I think if you, um, you know, it's not too late to think about a different career path. Uh, accounting is good. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> there's, there's, there's so much more to coffee than I, that, than I thought there was when I got into coffee and, um, so there, there is something to be, so I was kind of joking about the accounting thing, but I mean, it is really good to have like financial chops in order, you know, yeah, it's like, go ahead, like get your MBA when you're young, you know, or get that, um, you know, go to college and get that, uh, that degree in, in chemistry or, you know, uh, apprentice with an electrician if you really wanna, if you're really passionate about learning how to roast. Um, there's so many um, different skill sets that overlap um, cof the coffee roasting business that um, I would say, you know, I could have pursued more intensely. I mean, my my focus kind of narrowed in in uh, a certain uh, channel of uh, coffee, the coffee business. And I think as you're getting into it, it's like, you know, cast a wide net and, you know, whether it's. Uh, whether it's the tech side of things or um, or the financial side of things or the, you know, learn Spanish uh, or and or other uh, foreign languages. You know, if you're if you know you're going to be sourcing coffee in, in Brazil or in Portuguese, learn Swahili, you know, there's the, the, the more you could communicate with partners internationally, the better. So that's 
there's a bucket of advice for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I coffee is so romantic that people just jump in sometimes, but I like a little bit of business acumen and planning, I think would be key. There's a, yeah, I, um, my last thing is just a quick, we've had a few more like retail focused like product offering questions. Is there um, a customer service um, email or um, phone number or anything like that we could refer people to? At Equator, um, mm -hmm. yes, it's um, we have info at equatorcoffees.com. That's coffees has an S on the end, so it's Equator Coffees. If you write Equator Coffee, it goes to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually know um, who that is. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, yeah, feel feel free to reach out there. Thank you. you. Yeah. So we have we had some product specific questions. So I wanted to make sure that we we could direct people. So yeah. um, info at equatorcoffees.com. Yeah, I, I saw that question about instant coffee. We were no we're working with a new instant coffee supplier based in Oregon. And oh, we yeah. will be getting we'll be getting restocked. We're not doing the capsules anymore. We're doing packets. Mm -hmm. and they will be we're supposed to be receiving them next week, so we'll be restocked soon. Cool. Well, yeah. I think on that note, um, thank you both. This has been super informative. And I, I think there's a lot of, I hope roasters were taking notes because I think there are some really great points about structuring your menu that would be very valuable for new and even established roasters to kind of review operations. Um, so Mauricio and Ted, thank you both so much. Um, I think there might be a poll popping up momentarily, but um, stay tuned for more uh, cool conversations with us. And if anybody has any questions, hit me up, Jen at genuineorigin.com. There's our exit survey, yay. Um, so again, thank you all. Thank you for all of our participants. Um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Bye. Thank you, Ted, again.